Well, I thought there'd be a podium, so I'm <laughs> a bit scared. Uh, <laughs> Chris asked me to tell again how we found the structure of DNA. And since, you know, I follow his orders, I'll do it. But it slightly bores me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I wrote a book. So I'll say something. Uh, I'll say a little about, uh, you know, how the discovery was made and why Francis and I found it. And then I hope maybe I have uh, at least five minutes to say what uh, uh, makes me tick now. Uh, back of me is a, a picture of me when I was uh, 17. I was at the University of Chicago in my third year. And uh, I was in my third year because the, the University of Chicago let you in after two years of high school. So you, uh, it, was, it was fun to get away from high school. And because uh, I'm very small and I was no good in sports or anything like that. But I should say that. Uh, uh, my background, my uh, father was, you know, raised to be an Episcopalian and Republican, but uh, after one year of college, he became an atheist and a Democrat. <laughs> and uh, uh, my mother was Irish Catholic, and, but she didn't take ser uh, you know, religion too seriously, and by the age of 11, I was no longer going to Sunday Mass and going on bird watching uh, walks with my father. So uh, early on, I heard of Charles Darwin. Uh, I guess, you know, he was the, the big hero. And, you know, uh, you understand life as it now exists uh, through evolution. And uh, at the University of Chicago, I was a zoology major and thought I would end up, uh, you know, if I was bright enough, maybe getting a PhD from Cornell in ornithology. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, in the Chicago paper, there was a review of a book that, uh, called What is Life by the great physicist Schrodinger. And that, of course, had been a question I wanted to know. You know, Darwin explained life after it got started, but what was the essence of life? And uh, Schrodinger said the essence was information uh, present on our chromosomes, and it had to be present uh, uh, on a molecule. <laughs> I never really thought of molecules before you know, chromosome, but this was a molecule, and uh, somehow the information was probably present in some digital form, and there was a big question, how did you copy the information? So uh, that was the book, and uh, so from that moment on, I <laughs> wanted to uh, uh, be a geneticist, understand the gene, and through that, understand life. So. Uh, I had, you know, a hero at a distance, wasn't a baseball player, it was Linus Pauling. And uh, so I applied to Caltech and uh, they turned me down. Uh, <laughs> so I went to Indiana, which was actually as good as Caltech in genetics. And uh, besides, they had a really good basketball team. So I had a really quite happy life in Indiana. And it was in Indiana, uh, I got the impression that, you know, the gene was likely to be DNA. And so when I got my PhD, I should go in search of DNA. So I first went to uh, Copenhagen because uh, I thought, well, maybe I could become a biochemist, but I discovered biochemistry was very boring. Uh, it wasn't going anywhere toward, you know, saying what the gene was. It was just nucleosides. And, uh, oh, that's the book, little book. You can read it in about two hours. And, uh, but then I went to a meeting in Italy, and uh, uh, there was an unexpected speaker. He wasn't on the program, and he talked about DNA. This was Morris Wilkins. He was trained as a physicist, and after the war, he wanted to do biophysics, and he picked DNA because DNA had been shown at the Rockefeller Institute to possibly be the genetic molecules on the chromosomes. Most people believed it was proteins. But Wilkins uh, you know, thought DNA was the best bet, and uh, he showed this X-ray photograph. And it was sort of crystalline. So DNA had a structure, even though it all oh, probably different molecules carried different set of instructions. So there was something universal about the DNA molecule. So I wanted to work with him, but he didn't want a former bird watcher. And I ended up in Cambridge, England. So I went to Cambridge because uh, 
It was really the best place in the world then for X-ray crystallography. And X-ray crystallography is now subject to, you know, chemistry departments. But in those days, it was in the domain of the physicists. So uh, the best place for X-ray crystallography was at the Cavendish Laboratory at uh, Cambridge. And uh, there I met Francis Crick. Uh, I went there without knowing him. He was 35, I was 23. And uh, within a day, we uh, decided that uh, maybe we could take a shortcut to finding the structure of DNA, not solve it by, you know, uh, in rigorous fashion, but build a model, a molecular model, using some coordinates, some you know, length, all that sort of stuff, uh, from X-ray photographs, but just ask what the molecule, how should it fold up? And uh, the reason for doing so is Senator of the photograph, Ms. Linus Pauling, about six months before, he proposed the alpha helical structure for proteins. And in doing so, he banished the man on the right, uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg who was the Cavendish professor. This is a photograph several years later when Bragg had caused a smile. He certainly wasn't smiling when I got there because he was somewhat humiliated by Pauling getting the alpha helix and the Cambridge people failing because they weren't chemists. <laughs> and uh, certainly neither Crick or I were chemists. So we tried to build a model and uh, he knew, uh, Francis knew Wilkins. Wilkins said he thought it was a helix, X-ray diagram he thought was compatible with the helix. So we built a three-stranded model. The people from London came up, Wilkins and this uh, collaborator or possible collaborator, Rosalind Franklin, came up and sort of laughed at our model. They said it was lousy and uh, it was. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we were told to build no more models. We were incompetent. And, uh, <laughs> So we didn't build any models, and Francis sort of continued to work on proteins, and basically I did nothing, uh, and uh, except read. You know, uh, basically reading is a good thing. You get facts. And uh, we kept telling the people in London that Linus Pauling is going to move on to DNA. If DNA is that important, Linus will know it. He'll build a model, and everyone will be scooped. And in fact, he'd written the people in London, could he see their x-ray photograph? And they had the wisdom to say no, so he didn't have it. But there was ones in the literature, actually Linus didn't look at them that carefully. But uh, about uh, you know, 15 months after I got to Cambridge, or rumors began to appear from Linus Pauling's son who was in Cambridge, his father was now working on DNA. And uh, so one day Peter came in, it says Peter Pauling, and gave me a copy of his father's manuscripts. And uh, boy, I was scared because I thought, you know, we may be scooped. I have nothing to do, no qualifications for anything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there was the paper, and he proposed uh, a three standard structure. And I read it, and it was just, it was crap. Uh, <laughs> So this was, you know, unexpected uh, from the world. <laughs> and uh, so it was held together by hydrogen bonds between phosphate groups. Well, at the uh, peak pH that cells have, around seven, those hydrogen bonds couldn't exist. We rushed over to the chemistry department and said, could Pauling be right? And Alex Todd said no, so uh, uh, we were happy. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, we, we were still in the game, but we were fr frightened that someone at Caltech would tell Lorraine us that he was wrong. And uh, so Bragg said build models, and uh, a month after we got the polling manuscript, uh, I should say, I took the manuscript to London to show the people, you know, that Linus was wrong and they were still in the game. And they should immediately start building models. But uh, Wilkins said no. Uh, Rosalind Franklin was leaving in about two months. And after she left, uh, he would start building models. And uh, so I came back with that news to Cambridge and Bragg said build models. Or, of course, I wanted to build models. And uh, there was a picture of Rosalind. Uh, and she really, you know, in one sense, she was a chemist, but really she would have been trained, uh, she didn't know any organic chemistry or quantum chemistry. She was a crystallographer. And uh, I think part of the reason she didn't want to build models is she wasn't a, a chemist, whereas Pauling was a chemist. And uh, 
So Crick and I uh, you know, started building models, and I learned a little chemistry, but not enough. Well, we got the answer on 28th of uh, February, 53, and it was because of a rule, which to me is a very good rule, never be the brightest person in the room. And uh, we weren't. I mean, we weren't the best chemists in the room. I went in and showed them a, a pairing I'd done, and then <laughs> Jerry Donahue, he was a chemist, he said, it's wrong. You got the hydrogen atoms are in the wrong place. I just put them down like they were in the books. He said they were wrong. So the next day, you know, after I thought, well, he might be right, so I changed the locations, and then we found the, the base pairing, and Francis immediately said the chains run in opposite directions, and uh, we knew we were right.